Hi, this is Scott Morrison. Welcome to the Foothills Calvary YouTube channel. We're a church located in Lakewood, Colorado as part of the Calvary Chapel movement. Our goal is to provide an opportunity for you to hear the whole word of God preached chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and follow along as we read God's word together. We hope you find this channel encouraging and that God speaks to you through his word and through the Holy Spirit. Well, today, as uh, Mike read, we're in James 1, 9 through 18, and the title is Perspective, Perseverance, and Purpose. And I could probably add three other words to that, and we could make the title really long, but that's kind of the main focus, perspective, perseverance, and purpose. Three words that make sense in our brains, but all three words require us to do some work. And in that, it, it's best if we do the brunt of that work in God's word. And then the balance of that work, we, we do through prayer and, and through the, the Holy Spirit bringing understanding to us. And my exhortation to you this morning and every time we, we do any type of a Bible study, either a Sunday morning or a small group piece, is that you guys be a Berean. Remember the Bereans, well, they studied the word. They checked to make sure Paul was on point with what God was saying. I challenge you to do the same thing. Don't just take my word for it. Study it. Don't just do a Sunday morning thing. Engage in your study. Amen? It's a particular attitude. This is perspective, an attitude, a, a way of thinking or understanding of something. How you see a particular issue in general. In general. It's a point of view. As we talked about it before, we have a Christian worldview or a biblical worldview. That is a worldview based on God's word, his unchanging word. And since God is the author and creator of everything in heaven and earth, he alone is the standard for truth. God is all powerful, all knowing, he is unchanging. So having proper perspective is imperative if we are to mature in our faith. How many of you want to mature in your faith, right? We all do. That's the goal. We don't want to just stay stagnant and do a religious thing. We want to grow in our relationship with the Lord. It is in God's word and through prayer and the engagement of the Holy Spirit that those affected by trials and temptations find encouragement. That's how we keep proper perspective. We think about life questions. I did a lot of that this week. A lot of life questions. Why are you doing what you're doing now? School. Job, retired, young, old, married, single. There's a reason you are where you are today. You and I are not where we are today in life by accident. There is purpose there. A dear friend of mine this last week sent me a few texts and just scriptures and, and a reminder that they were praying for me. And, and one of the statements in the text caught me off guard a bit as I was struggling a little bit being in South Dakota, being by myself after the kids left, and you're just kind of there. And, and this text comes through, and, and part of it said, with God, you may be solo, but you're never alone. Well, we know that, but, but sometimes we need those reminders. And shortly after that, another friend sent a prayer and, and had said, I've been praying for you and the change that God has placed in your life for whatever plans he has set forth. I'm not where I am by accident. God has a plan. I'm not where I am by myself. I'm with God. God is walking with me. It's the same for all of us. Both statements so true, and, and they caused me to pause and, and to make sure that my perspective is correct. I am where I am because God has directed it. You are where you are because God is the one that's directing it. And in that, we can choose to be bitter as we go through the trial, or we can be better at activating our faith in, in hard times. When hard times come, a lot of times we want to go hide in a hole. But the reality is that we need to step into it and press in. Why do you believe what you believe about God and his word? And I've already made the statement that, that it is truth, the truth. Do you believe Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Do you believe? Do you live like you believe it? 
How do you perceive yourself? How do you perceive your life circumstances? Do you see yourself through God's eyes? Do you understand that you're a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Or is your perspective influenced by the world's view of humanity? You see, proper perspective and perseverance through trials brings us to our purpose and actually helps us fulfill that purpose according to God's will, God's plan, and God's timing for our lives. And I could go off the rails here and keep us here till three or four o'clock today. God's divine providence. That's what we're talking about. His will, his plan, his timing for each of our lives. Let's look at verses 9 through 11 again. Somebody shut off my fan. Excuse me. It's hot up here. All right, James 1, 9 through 11. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because like flower and grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flowers falls off and its beauty, the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So to the rich man in the midst of his pursuit will fade away. In our intro to James, we ended with verses five through eight. If you lack wisdom, ask in faith not doubting. If we ask in doubt, we're considered double-minded and unstable in all of our ways. We can't really expect to hear God answer us if we ask in doubt. Now we're seeing instruction continued. This whole book leans into humility and that when we are humble, it is God who lifts us up. When those who are humble in humble circumstances or are lowly, they find themselves brought to a higher position. Or if they're lifted up by God, they should glory, they should rejoice in what God is doing. And it's easier for them to do that than it is for a rich person to be humbled by trials and temptations. When I was a youth pastor at uh, Calvary Temple, we were down by Cherry Creek Mall, if you're familiar with the area. There's Denver Country Club, the Polo Grounds. Surrounded, we're, we're, our ministry was surrounded by mansions and wealthy people. One of the hardest places to evangelize that I've found in the Denver metro area. I, I liken it to jackhammering concrete with a plastic spoon. They had everything they needed in their perspective. Why do I need God? Why should I surrender to Christ? Their wealth, their things, their positions, uh, their status, that's all that mattered to them. Linsky said, as the poor brother forgets all his earthly poverty, the rich brother forgets all his earthly riches because by faith in Christ, the two are equal. There is no rich or poor in heaven. We're, we're equal in God's eyes. James shifts in, in from trials and wisdom to riches and humility. As we mature as a Christian, we should gain proper perspective of these things. Our faith in God is, is living, it's active, it's a continuous learning of who God is and who we are in Christ. We don't just stop learning, it's a process. Because like flowering grass, he, the rich man, will pass away. Trials serve to remind the rich and the high and the mighty that though they are comfortable in this life, it is still only this life which will fade as the grass grows brown and the flowers fade away. Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker with the motorhome, really nice motorhome, towing a fancy car, towing a boat with a trailer behind that with a nice motorcycle on it, and they're going up the road, and you can see the pearly gates ahead, and it just simply says you can't take it with you. And look at Jesus' words in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Tony Evans puts it this way. Giving is not God's way of raising cash. It's God's way of raising kids. Every time I give, I'm giving away a part of my stinginess and my selfishness. God doesn't need my money, but I need to give. The Lord wants my heart, not my money. 
And he knows that wherever my treasure is, that my heart will be there. If I have financial investments, I'll follow the stock market carefully. If I hold real estate, I'll follow the housing market with genuine interest. But if I have treasure in heaven, guess where my heart will be? It's profoundly interesting to me that Jesus didn't say, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. Instead, he said, put your treasure in heaven and your heart will inevitably follow. So how can we be more heavenly hearted? By sending our treasure ahead of us. Again, as a youth pastor, I had wanted more involvement from, from those older than I. And at the church at the time, it was a pretty big church. They had a Sunday school class that was uh, about 150, 200 uh, retirees. And uh, they met every Sunday morning, had Sunday school. And I went and did a presentation. And I talked to them about youth ministry and the impact we were making in, in our community. And I didn't want an offering. I wanted them. They took an offering anyways. And one gentleman came up to me and handed me a rather large check. And I told him, thank you, but I didn't want his money. And I gave the check back to him. And I said, I want you. I need you. They began to greet the kids on Sunday morning. They were at the door and they were our greeters in their late 70s. And the kids just thought it was amazing. They loved the fact that older folks would care enough to come and serve them. And pretty soon they're helping feed lunches when we had activities and they were getting food together. And, and they were part of that ministry team. See, there was value. What really matters in life as we were driving to South Dakota, uh, we kept commenting on how green things were in August. And the flowers, the wildflowers everywhere, and everything was just green and beautiful. And the humidity was terrible. But it was beautiful. But eventually their beauty is going to fade. They're going to dry up. They're not going to last. They're going to wither away as the elements continue, as the heat continues, and then as the seasons change and they'll dry up and wither. On the scale of eternity, this is how quickly so too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. The things that we own are gonna fade away. The riches of the world will fade away. So if we put our lives and our identities in the things that we own or the things that we do or the position of authority or the status that we hold, it's all gonna fade away. If you and I are only rich in this world, when we die, it's all going to be left behind. It all fades away. However, if you and I are rich in the Lord, when we die, we go to our riches. Something that's always confounded me, and I thought about this later after I finished the message, but how many of you have a house full of stuff? You're not going to want to raise your hand on the next question. Just warning you. How many of you have so much stuff that you had to go get a storage unit so you can get some of your stuff out of your house so you had more room? Like, why do we do that? What are we doing with all that stuff? I'm getting our house, man. I've gotten rid of so much stuff. I have this big pile in the garage. I'm gonna have a garage sale or a Goodwill goodbye. <laughs> like, we just get stuff. What is it for? John Corson said the Jewish Christians to whom James is writing would be well aware of an enemy that posed a threat to the people of God throughout their history. Led by giants like Goliath, the Philistines hassled the Jews continually. Now in our day, we don't fear the Philistines, but it seems that finances bring into as many, us into as many trials and testing points. I don't know of a man or woman who either at some point or regularly doesn't deal with a financial trial, wondering how to make ends meet. Whether individually or as a church family, corporately, finances have proven to be the Philistine that stomps and threatens us continually. You know, Pam and I never, we didn't argue. Like she might slam a cabinet door and I might stomp a minute. Like that was an argument done. But the times that we got most tense with each other was over the finances. Anybody? Just us maybe, I don't know. Like there's something in that, right? Knowing this, James reminds us that regardless of our financial situation on earth, we are exalted, elevated above the world system because we're part of a kingdom whose streets are paved with gold. How amazing is that? So that's whether we're worried about poverty or we're weighed down with riches, we can be absolutely free if we keep a heavenly 
perspective. Remember, we're just passing through here. This is not our home. Both the poor and the rich offer examples of responding to life with wisdom. The brother of humble circumstances is a fellow who doesn't have much. James tells this person to boast in his exaltation, to glory in the fact that God is conforming him to Christ through his struggle. What is our perspective? But the rich man is to, po- is to boast in his humiliation. In other words, James reminds the rich man that nothing material that he has is going to last. It'll fade away like grass and flowers. There's more to life than having stuff, than having things. Don't neglect the eternal. In that and even processing through this this week, thinking about what are those things that are important and valuable to us. You know, I I call my granddaughters Club Chaos for a good reason. But I love them so much. Like we have so much fun and they love me. And and they love Nani, Pam, and they miss her. But what are those things that we value? Don't wait until somebody passes away to invest and to love on your family, amen? That is not in the message. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay, that was perspective. Now we have perseverance. The persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. The Bible teaches us to persevere in faith, trusting God to fulfill his promises. When we face difficulties, we can trust that God understands our situation. He sees our distress. And living for the Lord in times of trial and temptation brings a blessing to those who endure. Endure. There's another fun word. You like that one? To experience and to bear something difficult, painful, or even unpleasant. Biblically, to bear up under hardship and persecution, to to remain under, to, to be strong and firm, to persevere beneath a heavy burden. When Jesus says the one who endures to the end will be saved, he's speaking of those who are truly born again, whose lives are transformed by the Holy Spirit. True followers of Christ will withstand the onslaught of wickedness. They'll recognize and reject false teaching. That's why I'm always telling you, get in the word, be a Berean, go after it, make sure you understand it. Those who are doing this will overcome the world and they'll be granted a reward in the world to come. Those who have been sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption have his power working in them to enable them to stand firm, to endure, to persevere. Let's read verses 12 through 15 of James 1. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lusts. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Blessed is the man. You guys remember the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, statements of blessing. And here we read that we can be blessed as we persevere, if we endure trials and temptation. It doesn't say blessed is the man who never faces trials or temptations, or blessed is the man who finds trials and temptations easy. Blessed is the one who perseveres through the trials and temptations. To be blessed by God, that's a gift. It is his favor for the one who says no to temptation or no to allowing the trials to take them under, and it's saying yes to God. When we say yes to temptation, God's favor diminishes. How many of you like tests? Anybody, a test taker? Brandon, my son, man, he, he'll read like the day of the test 
whatever he's supposed to, and then shh, 100%. <laughs> I can't do that. I have test anxiety. Anybody else? I write a paper. I can do a project. Put me in a math class as long as I have a framing square and a tape measure. I'm good to go. Otherwise, no thank you. James states God's purpose in allowing these tests, these trials and temptations, is to approve us through the testing of our genuine faith. And when we're tested, our faith rises up. It has an opportunity to build, to, to, go, to grow strength. Temptation is one of the trials we face every day. Does anybody not face temptation every, every day? Maybe every hour? Right? We all, that's something we all face. We all have a consistent choice of what we do when those temptations come. It's a daily thing. Remember James 1, 2, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you, account, when you encounter various trials, when we encounter these tests, when we encounter these temptations, consider it joy. Because we know that it's working for our betterment, for our good. Temptation, a definite trial. As we persevere through temptation, we are approved and the reward is given and evident through our resistance to temptation. The crown of life, which the Lord has promised. James is reminding us that it'll be worth it if we persevere under temptations that we face. And we're to show our love for Jesus by resisting temptation, by walking through trials confident, confident that Jesus is walking with us. He hasn't abandoned us. And this is where reward comes, where his favor is expressed in our lives. It's through obedience to him. Spurgeon said, there's a crown for me? Then I will gird up my loins. I will quicken my pace since the crown is so sure to those who run with patience. You see, everybody, everybody's looking for a blessing. Anybody? You want a blessing, don't you? Now you don't want to raise your hand because you think it's a trick question. Everybody's looking for a blessing. Unfortunately, what they often mean by a blessing is a new car, a bigger house, uh, the perfect mate, uh, a, a sensational job, maybe a significant raise. A true blessing, however, is a God-given capacity to experience and to enjoy and to extend his goodness in this life that we're living. God's favor, the favor of God is so valuable. I know there's been times where I've just rested under so much of God's favor because I've been focused on him and I'm dialing into him. And, and, and there's been times where, man, maybe I've turned a little bit. I'm not where I'm supposed to be and I can feel a little bit of that favor, a little bit of that blessing kind of lift. Like that's how it is through our lives. Regardless of whether God's blessing is, includes external components, they, they are intended to bring an internal change so that our lives display his kingdom. Our lives display a relationship with him that he is ruling in our lives. See, trials open up the door to God's blessings and his favor. So we are to receive them with joy. We obviously pray for wisdom and, and endurance. We want to grow in Christ's likeness and become a mature Christian. How many of you ever prayed like you're going through something and you're like, I mean, I've done this often. Okay, God, what do I need to learn so we can move on? <laughs> right? You come to those points where you're struggling, you're grinding, and it's like, God, what's happening here? Help me learn what I need to learn out of this and not waste it. Remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago of, of not wasting the trial as you go through it. Don't waste it. You're walking through it for a reason. Here's a reality check for all of us, this question. How much do you love? Like you walk through the doors and come into the foyer there and over in between the bathrooms, it's love God, love each other, right? How much do you love God? That, that's our motto. How, how much do you love God? How much do you love people? To those who love him, the ultimate motive for resisting temptation because of our love for God the passions of temptation can only be overcome by an even greater passion to honor and glorify God. If we're pursuing God, man, that gives us so much strength and ability. Some people resist temptation for fear of man. 
The thief becomes very honest at the sight of a police car. A man or a woman controls their lust because of fear of being found out, embarrassed, or causing harm to their loved ones. Others resist temptation to sin because of the power of yet another sin piling on top of that. A greedy miser gives up partying and drinking because they don't want to spend money. But the best motivation for all of us as believers, as followers of Christ, is to love God, to love him with a greater passion and power than that of the love for sin. We should hate sin. We forget that. We should hate sin. And as we mature in our walk with the Lord, our hate for sin should grow. If I've prayed for you personally, you may have heard me ask God to give you fresh vision and passion to pursue that God-given vision. The idea is what is our focus? What is our heart drive? This, This is an inner drive to glorify God in everything that we do. May I glorify God. May my faith be seen. That should be our focus. Spurgeon Spurgeon said it this way, so that those who endure temptation rightly endure it because they love God. They say to themselves, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? They cannot fall into sin because it would grieve him who loves them so well and whom they love with all their hearts we got to go all in. We talked about this in the first lesson in James. James was all in. He believed. We've got to be all in. Look at verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted that I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, for he himself does not tempt anyone. Temptation doesn't come from God. Now, he allows it, but he does not entice us to evil. Though God may test our faith, but it'll be without a solicitation to evil. James is addressing the fact that people have a tendency to blame God when they find themselves in a trial or under temptation. Have you ever blamed God before? I have. (laughs) God's very nature, though, doesn't allow him to be tempted or to tempt us. God does not allow temptation to destroy us. We have the ability to push it back and walk away from it. We have the freedom and the choice. Poole said he shows a great cause of sin, that lust has a greater hand in it than either the devil or his instruments, who cannot make us sin without ourselves. They sometimes tempt and do not prevail. All we have to do is look at the Bible and we see that God sometimes allows great tests to come to his people, even those who seem to be his favored people. Genesis 22 says, when God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his son, what kind of a test would that be? How many of you would put your son on the altar? What a test. Or the affliction allowed to come to Job in chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Job. At other times, God sent tests as a form of judgment upon those who rejected him. A spirit of deception even. Or departing from a man and refusing to answer I don't ever want to be that man. Yet in no case does God entice a person to evil. Spurgeon puts it this way, Satan tempts, God tries. But the same trial may be both a temptation and a trial, and it may be a trial from God's side and a temptation from Satan's side. Just as Job suffered from Satan and it was a temptation, but he also suffered from God through Satan, so it was a trial to him. I would say that even like this, putting this message together, going through everything I did this last year and a half with Pam, that, that trial, man, Satan's in there continually. Temptation, boom, temptation. Take me back places in my mind. It's a battle that we have to overcome. And you see, God does not tempt us. Instead, temptation comes when we are drawn away. Now listen, what are we drawn away by? We're drawn away by our own fleshly desires. We're enticed with what the world is throwing at us, what the devil is providing in enticement. Poole says of being drawn away, it is either a metaphor taken from a fish enticed by bait and drawn after it, or rather from a harlot drawing a young man out of the right way, alluring him with a bait of pleasure to commit folly with her. 
You see, we have a fallen nature. Temptation is a hook to that fallen nature, and it corrupts our God-given desires. And honestly, we give the devil too much credit. Have you ever said, the devil made me do it? Maybe you've heard someone say it. The devil made me do it, we say, and the reality is that we are drawn away by our own desires. We give in. We make a choice to give in. There are those also who beg the devil to tempt them so then they can blame him for their actions. If we don't keep the proper biblical perspective, we'll fail more than we succeed. A side note here. Something for us all to remember. If you do fail, how many of you have failed? Like this is not a, this is a judgment-free zone here. <laughs> My hands are higher. <laughs> we all fail, but God's grace is there for each one of us. You are going to fail. You are going to stumble. Don't stay there. You're out riding your bike and you wipe out, unless you're Pastor Nate, Nate and you break your neck and your back. You get up, you brush the rocks out of your knees and your elbows and maybe your forehead, and you start walking again. So you, you re-engage with your faith. God's grace is there. We repent. We ask for forgiveness. We turn away from that thing that we did. We re-engage with our faith in God. He takes us right where we're at. Get back up. Get going. Don't go backwards. Go forwards. Amen? Ever hear the term, if it doesn't glorify God, don't do it? That's a term that Brandon and I argued about when he was a middle schooler. <laughs> if it doesn't glorify God, don't do it. What was it gonna glorify God if I turn the light switch on? It's not what we're talking about. What are your actions? What are the things that you're going to do? Is it going to glorify God? It sounds so easy, doesn't it? If it doesn't glorify God, don't do it. There are some who like to emphasize the sovereignty of God and say God is responsible for all things, yet God is never responsible for man's sin. John Calvin said that when Scripture ascribes blindness or hardness of heart to God, it does not assign to him the beginning of blindness, nor does it make him the author of sin so as to ascribe to him the blame. He also wrote that Scripture asserts that the reprobate are to, are to be delivered up to their depraved lust. But is it because the Lord depraves or corrupts their hearts? By no means, for their hearts are subjected to depraved lust because they are already corrupt and vicious. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. The reality is that. That when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. It comes forward from our desire to sin. You don't have to treat, you know, so each of my granddaughters, and you've probably seen this with your own kids, when they're little, you don't have to teach them to hit somebody, to bite, to steal a toy. You don't teach them that, do you? I mean, maybe you do. We need to talk later. They do it on their own because it's in their nature, right? Right? comes forward from that desire. When we engage in sin, if we do not repent, that is, if we do not ask for forgiveness, if we don't turn from it, if we're engaging in that sin, it's going to bring death. It's going to destroy you. And this is the progression to death, and it's an inevitable result that Satan always tried to hide from us, but we should never be deceived about it. You have to remember, as we get further into the book of James, you're going to see that if we resist the devil, this is a promise, we resist the devil and he will flee. Resist him. We must, especially as Christians, keep this in the forefront of our minds. It is a spiritual battle with deadly consequences. Clark said James represents men's lust as a harlot, entices their understanding, and it will into its and will into its impure embraces. And from that conjunction conceives sin. Sin being brought forth immediately acts and is nourished by frequent repetition until at length it gains such strength that it turns it and begets death. That is the true genealogy of sin and death. And then verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. You see, the devil doesn't need to break your leg or give you a concussion. Satan's great strategy and temptation is to convince us that the pursuit of our corrupt desires will somehow produce life and goodness for us. 
The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Just do it. Or if it feels good, do it. Whatever works for you. That's the mentality in our world. That's where this is coming from. It's the devil driving it. We must remember that Jesus told us in John 10, 10, that the thief, that is Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy any way that he can. That's why I'll often I'll, I'll tell my leaders, like, we're doing something great in ministry here. Keep your head on a swivel. The attacks come from different directions. The temptations come from different ways and different things that, that we never thought would come. Pay attention. See, because Satan hates God, he hates God's creation. Guess what you are? God's creation. Guess who Satan hates? You, me. If we can remember this, we're going to be more effective in resisting the deception and the temptations of the devil. It is truly spiritual warfare. My brother from another mother, Matt Corniotis from C4, Calvary Chapel, Cherry Creek, he said this in one of our conversations. He said, our flesh is never satisfied. The father of all things flesh-driven, that is Satan, is dissatisfied to an excruciating level. Remember, he wanted to be God. He wanted to be in control. He got cast out. That equals the amount of heat that he sends to us. Like he is suffering, he wants to destroy God's creation, he wants to take us down. That's why those temptations come in such on a continuous basis. Especially as you engage more in your faith, as you're, you're stepping out more, as you're wanting to learn more, Satan comes in, he's digging at you. But we gotta remember, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Amen? We don't have to succumb to it. In all of this, Christians, we must, as Christians, we must distinguish between trials and temptations. Temptation is solicitation to do evil, and the same Greek word is used here to speak of both trial and temptation. They differ in terms of source and purpose and outcome. In the very same event, God and the devil can be at work, one to test you, the other to tempt you. But we must be clear, it's not God who tempts you. And any temptation hatched by Satan must pass through God's fingers, even though God is not its source. Again, look in the book of Job and read, read through that. You see, Satan desires your downfall. God desires your development. When we sin, we, we break fellowship with God and we slow that development. That's been my life. That's part of my testimony, serving God and stepping out in a way and, and until God got a hold of me. That doesn't mean that sin and temptation isn't there anymore. The more that I engage, even in ministry here, getting ready for a Sunday morning, guys, the battle's on. It usually starts about Wednesday. And once I step on the platform, I'm good until I step off. <laughs> like there's a battle. About nine years ago, I heard a message by Ed Taylor. Uh, it was really when I first started hearing about Calvary Chapels, and it was about the subject of sin and temptation, and he made a statement that has stuck with me ever since. And it's very simple. He asked the question, are you sinning? Stop it. <laughs> oh, I can stop? <laughs> are you sinning? Stop. Change your perspective. Yes, stop. We have to be intentional. E even praying, lead me not into temptation and deliver me from evil. It's a good prayer. Do you know where it's from? Come on, the Lord's Prayer. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. You know, we can be in the word. You know that we can be serving God. We can be worshiping God, but we can still give into temptation because we're human and that's part of our nature. And if we don't address it, if we don't push away from it, it's going to bring death and destruction. So be determined to start the day in prayer. Dedicate the day to the Lord. Get into the Word. Seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then get out there and share that hope with others. Don't, all right, if you've got all the preparation, I'm done. I'm going to hide in my closet. I'll see you tomorrow. Go and share and engage. 
Share the hope that you have. God has done amazing things in your life. Let somebody know about it. Even in, in South Dakota, after everybody left, I'm, I'm back in the corner of this, this, this great campground and the closest trailer to me, I think, is like six spaces over and there's only four or five others. And this lady's walking her, her dog and she comes around and she's like, oh, are you packing up to go? I'm like, no, it's just me hanging out. And we start talking and we end up talking about the Lord and I shared what happened with Pam and that the kids were there. And man, God just used that as an opportunity for, for ministry and sharing hope. And, and by the time we're done hot talking, she, she's like, oh, can I give you a hug? And she, and she hugged me and she just started weeping. Like, guys, we take just take opportunities that God gives us to share hope with somebody. That's what we do. So get ready. Make sure your perspective is there. Make sure that you're persevering, you're enduring so you can give hope. And that is part of our purpose. Purpose. The reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. Biblically speaking, the purposes for the believer are to be made alive in Christ, to be transformed and conformed to the image of Christ by God's grace through faith and to do good works that God has prepared ahead of time for you to do. And that's Ministry is not just about coming in church on Sunday morning or doing a Bible study during the week. It's about everyday life. It's how you engage at school with other students. It's how you engage at work. It's, it's how you engage even if you're retired. We're all to live our faith out loud, to be engaged in it. You see, we have hope. God's goodness stands in contrast to the temptations that we face. Look at verses 17 and 18. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, be brought us, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruit among his creatures. Remember, we've already talked about we have fallen natures. We can expect no goodness from that nature or from those who would try to entice us to sin. We have to remember within that, bad company corrupts good behavior, right? Like we've got to pay attention to where we're at. One thing that we can expect though and, and count on is that every good gift, every perfect gift comes from God the Father in heaven. The author and creator of you and I and everything that we know gives good gifts. Now, where we struggle in our humanity is how we measure a gift, right? We must measure it on an eternal scale. There are things in our physical world that we may deem as good, like winning that huge jackpot at the casino that you shouldn't have been at, or winning a billion-dollar lottery. Anybody want to do that? But that might be the very thing that brings your destruction, a side note here, according to the National Endowment for Financial Education, 70% of lottery winners go bankrupt within a few years. Extra information for your brain. You're welcome. Also, if you have extra money to burn like that, <clears throat> let me know. I'll help you invest it. Listen to this next statement. With whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God's goodness is constant. There's no variation. There's nothing done in the shadow. God is the father of lights. You know, part of my testimony, we've talked about my dad in the past and he's not a good influence. And when Pam and I were having marital problems, my dad really was an instigator of many of those problems. And we'd go out and talk in his garage while he's smoking his cigarette and he would slip me cash, $100, $200. Like every time we'd go over, just don't tell Pam, this is for you. He's just trying to, you know, give me a gift and help me out a little. No, there was deception. It was hidden, done in the shadows. You see, God is not that way. Our Heavenly Father does, does things up on the up and up in the light so it's seen for all to see. And they're good gifts, good things. We start every Sunday stating God is good because he is. He also gives good gifts consistently. No variation. He's not moody. He doesn't have bad days and good days. He's not like me, good and generous one day and a 
grouchy pants the next. You and I are variable. We go up and down. We have highs and lows. But God isn't that way. He is nothing but good. He doesn't react to us according to how we're doing with him either. Praise God for that. Our relationship with him, we're up and down. In it. He is constant. He is consistent. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God is good when I'm grumpy. He was good this week as I was camping and I had times of, of sadness and even dread. He, he was good in the times this week when I had peace and, and joy. He does not change. A, a question that I had asked a friend that was really struggling. Um, he, this is, he's been, I've known him since he was in eighth grade and he's 40 something now, which means I'm really old. Um, he struggles with autism and he always want, he, I want a family, I want, you know, two kids, I want one and a half dogs and a cat, I'm where we get that stat from. Um, and I'm like, but is God still God if you get those things? Well, yes, okay. Is God still God if you don't? Don't talk to me about that. That came back around and bit me because a few years later, a couple years ago, is God still God if Pam is healed? Well, yeah. Is God still God if he takes her home? Yes, he is. And is he still good? Absolutely. Absolutely. He is locked into his nature. That in itself is why I love the Lord so much. He is solid as a rock. I can live my life knowing that I don't have to worry about him being mad at me because I'm such a dork and I make bad decisions and I sin. And he's going to still love me. He's not going to get tired of me. He gives nothing but good gifts, for he is indeed a good God. Amen? Hybert said the ancient Greek is actually the father of lights, God, the creator of the heavens. The specific light, these specific lights are celestial bodies that light up the sky, both day and night. The sun and stars never stop giving light, even when we can't see them. So even so, there is never a shadow with God. When it's nighttime, it's not because the sun shut off. It's because the earth turned, right? It's turned from the, the, the sun and there's darkness that happens. And this is an interesting thought to me. Those times that you feel distant from God. Anybody, you ever feel distant from God, right? We have those times. Those times that you feel distant and in a dark place is not because God left. It's because you turned. Where are you facing? This means God never changes. There are some modern theologians in our world who believe what, what they call process theology, meaning they believe God is continually maturing and learning and growing, that God is in process. But time and time again in the Bible, we see there is no variation, there is no shadow, there is no turning of God. He is almighty and all powerful. First part of verse 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. James understood that the gift of salvation was given by God and not earned by the work of obedience of man. It was his own, word, his own will that brought us forth for salvation. Purpose starts somewhere. Trapp said the word properly signifies he did the office of a mother to us, bringing us into the light of life. We can see God's goodness in our salvation as he initiated our salvation of his own will. He brought forth spiritual life by his word, the, the word of truth, that we might be his glory of first fruits, his harvest. For God so loved the world, he gave us his son. An opportunity for salvation. In the previous verse, James told us what the lust of man brings forth, simply sin and death. Here he tells us that the will of God is good, a good God, and it brings us salvation a kind of first fruit of his creatures. That brings us so much hope. That should bring us joy. God loved you before you could love him. All right, as we close, a couple things I want you guys to remember. When we are faced with temptation, it's imperative that we shift our focus. 
four simple things. One, focus on the goodness of God. Every good and perfect gift is from him. Look to all the kindness God has shown you. Look to the miracles and the blessings that he's given you in your life rather than the temptation that's confronting you. Don't let your mind wander. Hold every thought captive as unto the Lord. It's going to take dedication. It's going to take work. And, and we tend to be negative. We tend to easily dwell on things that we should not. We have to change our stinking thinking. We have to focus on the goodness of God. The second is focus on the faithfulness of God's character. He is the father of lights who does not change like the shifting shadows. God never changes and always shines. God is consistently shining forth his goodness, his truth, and his grace. Turn to him, not away from him. Third, focus on his word. He, he gave us birth by the word of truth. And for many, the Bible's like the Queen of England. It's held in high esteem, but wields no power over them personally. But what scripture accomplished for our salvation, it also works for our sanctification. It works in and through us and brings change. We need to face temptation like Jesus did in Matthew 4. He answered each temptation with scripture. The word of God is indeed alive and powerful. After all, if the living word needed the written word to, be, to defeat the enemy of the word, then you and I most certainly need it as well. And last, focus on God's plan. Your first fruits of his creatures. The Israelites gave God the first fruits of their crops and flocks and herds, and they didn't demonstrated how they valued him by giving him the first and best of what they owned. As God's first fruits, you and I are the highest value to him. He values you. God loves you. You're not an accident or a mistake in this world. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. We're sons and daughters of the living God. You and I are children of the king. So don't succumb to the temptation and lower your dignity. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and for your word. God, as we look at perspective and perseverance and purpose, uh, we look at temptation resisted. Father, I pray that, that if anybody in this room is struggling with that, Lord, that, that you would give them the ability to see and to, to stand strong. God, help them to ask for help. Lord, we, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for, for loving us so much that you wanna speak to us through your written word. Help us to truly hear it and apply it to every area of our life. Help us to keep perspective so we may mature as a follower of Christ. Help us to keep proper perspective and to persevere through temptations and trials, knowing that it will bring us to our purpose. And in that, Father, would you help us fulfill our purpose according to your will, your plan, and your timing. Help us in those times when we feel that we're tempted beyond our own ability to resist. Help us to lean into our faith, trusting that you will equip us to make it through, that you will give us enough for the day. Help us to endure so, so we can receive our reward. Help us, Father, to love you the way you love us us pushing aside temptation and running our race with the goal of finishing well. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Maybe you're here today and you haven't had the proper perspective or understanding of persevering through trials and temptations and, and you're not sure what your purpose is because you don't have a relationship with God. Everything that we've talked about today centers on having a relationship with God. The reality is that we've all sinned. Every single person in this room has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But he's given us a good gift, an opportunity to have our sins forgiven, an opportunity to have a restored relationship with the Father. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the earth where he lived a perfect life, an example for us all. When his feet hit the ground, 
He was headed towards a cross where he would be crucified, where his blood would be shed to cover your sins and my sins, where that broken body then then would be taken and put into a grave, where three days later it, it would rise, where Jesus is in heaven with the Father now. Because of that, we have the opportunity to repent. We have the opportunity to turn from our sins, to ask for forgiveness, and to have that restored relationship. You see, we can try to fill that void that we have with everything else in the world. We can try to fill it with, with alcohol, with drugs, with sex, with pornography, with money, with even doing religious things. All those things will fade away. It's not going to fill that void. Only Jesus can fill that void that's in your heart. Romans 10, 9 says, uh, declares that he who believes in the heart and confesses with his mouth that Jesus died for his sins and rose from the dead will be saved. You see, we all have a choice. We have free will. You're not being forced or coerced into anything. We can choose to confess and believe and spend eternity in heaven. Or we can choose to decline and walk away, but then then that's eternity in hell. Our mission as a church, our mission as Christians, is to proclaim the gospel message. That is the message of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. I challenge you to confess and believe today. It's by faith and not anything else we can do. For by grace you have been saved through faith. The gospel message, the good news, is that anyone can do it. So today, if you feel that the Holy Spirit's prompting you, I'm going to ask you to say a simple prayer. I'm going to ask everybody to to bow your heads and close your eyes and, and really just ask you to have a conversation from your heart to God's heart doesn't even have to be the same words, but you do need to confess and believe. If that's you, pray something like this. Dear God, I know I need you in my life. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I confess that Jesus is Lord, and I believe you raised him from the dead. So Jesus, please be Lord of my life. Guide me use me to bring the hope of the gospel to others. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love to chat with you. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to encourage you. Um, It's just the beginning of an amazing journey and an amazing walk. It's not a one and done thing. It's a lifelong pursuit. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand uh, as we get to finish out the service and worship. Um, I'll hang out down front here if you want prayer for anything, and I'll be out in the foyer when we're down as well. John's down here ready to pray with you as well. Um, Before we sing, I just want to pray a blessing over you, Father. Um, First of all, I thank you for this group of believers that you brought them here this morning for purpose. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. My prayer is that your faith is seen and that God is glorified in all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.